Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. He's been called a tactical and strategic genius. He conquered vast swathes of Europe, but he also led hundreds of thousands of his own soldiers to their deaths. Historian Gareth Glover joins me and Mike to explain what makes Napoleon to some history's most successful military leader and how his legacy holds up today. Also on SITREP, Japan's pouring billions of pounds into building up its military might while strengthening defence ties with Britain. We assess the country's capability and what it's adding. What Japan calls counter-strike is really uh, retaliatory missile strikes. It's a whole range of cruise missiles which can be ground-launched It's buying Tomahawk missiles from the United States. It'll have about 400 of those. And the commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces sets out what he thinks he needs for victory as he declares the war right now a stalemate. Zeluzhny really should be admired, I think, for saying something that is so controversial, but nonetheless important. It plays into Russian propaganda in many respects. It just unfortunately happens to be the truth. Sitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. There's a data scientist called Ethan Arsht who has ranked generals across history using a reworked metric that measures the effectiveness of baseball players. And in his model, Napoleon comes out not just on top, but head and shoulders above everyone else. Uh, Mike, hi. Um, are you surprised? Not necessarily. Lots of lots of analysts do these sorts of rankings because uh, it's an irresistible temptation to try and rank generals. And Napoleon was extraordinarily successful. Um, actually, Wellington won more battles than Napoleon, depending on how you define a battle. But the thing about Napoleon, and the reason I think this is not a, an outrageous thing to say, was that Napoleon won the battles that mattered. He won battles that made a difference to European history, whereas Wellington won a lot of battles which as it happened, didn't make a whole lot of difference to European history. And that's the key thing. You know, which generals win when it matters? And Napoleon did. Mm. Well, you may be uh, wondering why are we talking about this today? Um, We thought it was worth a closer look at Napoleon's military legacy with a new film about to hit cinemas. The tagline, he came from nothing, he conquered everything. I follow in the footsteps of Alexander the Great and Caesar. My destiny has brought me here. I will win by fire. This vermin has held the world hostage. We are discovered. Good. I'm loving it already. Let's bring in Gareth Glover, historian and former Royal Navy officer who has written and edited numerous books about the Napoleonic Wars. Gareth, hi, thanks for joining us today. Um, What is it about Napoleon and his wars that makes you so interested in him? I think it's uh, the the primary thing is the fact that it's the first real world war, um, if you really want to get down to it, because... Clearly, this was not just a European campaign. This went everywhere in the world. Um, And Napoleon is such a huge character within it. Um, Mike is quite correct in saying that um, he won numerous important battles. I I suppose that changes after 1812, however, when he seems to start losing them on a regular basis, and that's why things change. So I agree with what's been said about him being a great, great general, but I'm not so sure he's number one. Okay, so so, uh, where would you put him? Oh, certainly in the top two or three. You know, so he's not far off the top. But, uh, you know, I'm not so sure he's head and shoulders above everybody else. And so of the battles that were a success, what were the keys to what he did on the battlefield? First of all, he coordinated all his forces and kept them close to each other so they could support each other. They moved fast and rapidly. You know, he effectively invented the ability to move armies across Europe fast and rapidly and bring them together at the important moment to defeat the enemy in uh, who have in great numbers to start with but he actually sort of brings greater numbers to the field at the right moment uh, and that's what his great secret was and mike um do you think napoleon's tactics and strategies were truly revolutionary as sometimes they are described 
Well, they were in the warfare of the day. He was strategically, he was very bold. He could see the situation and he moved quickly in a way that, that unbalanced his opponents, things that now seem obvious, but it wasn't so obvious at the time. And he could move quickly. He had a feel for the battle. He had a feel for tactics. He also had a feel for his soldiers, which a lot of um, aristocratic officers didn't. But he remember, he'd come from very little. He was part of a revolutionary army and he understood how to make his soldiers love him. You know, he used to do this thing when there was a parade he'd get somebody to tell him who was who is the sergeant third from the left on the on line number four in the parade oh that's pierre so-and-so so fine mm. so he'd go up and down the lines and then when he came to that particular line he'd walk past the sergeant then he'd come back and he'd look at him he'd look at him and say pierre it's you isn't it you know, pierre <laughs> you, you were with me on the bridge at marengo i remember you pierre we fought together complete rubbish of course but they loved him they absolutely they used to call him the little corporal they adored him they'd do anything for him till it came to waterloo and then they wouldn't quite mm. do anything for him because he, he, he expended their lives he became a tyrant he became a warlord only and and he he used the lives of his men in a way that was quite unconscionable but until that point until uh, 1812 1813 as Gareth said when it all started to go wrong for him he was a brilliant tactician and he understood armies he understood how they how they worked and that he under, understood the psychology of his soldiers uh, and Gareth that uh, speed on the battlefield that you spoke about um, how did he do that how did he achieve it well, he basically uh, left his army to feed themselves instead of having a, uh, a sort of a slow moving sort of supply system that he was sort of almost anchored to. He released them by saying, basically, act like locusts across the land and take the food you need, uh, which obviously was not, not great for the local populations that they actually uh, arrived near. But it allowed him that flexibility of not having this huge train of wagons behind him and desperately waiting for food to catch up with him etc and it allowed him to just charge ahead and sort of uh, move much faster than the other armies who hadn't gone down this road because of I, I suppose for many reasons but the main reason being that they didn't want to decimate the country in the same way that he didn't care about Mm. Well, let's just take a moment to consider a bit more why Napoleon was successful. I've been talking to Dr. Matilda Gregg, historian at the National Army Museum, about how Napoleon's background shaped him. He was a second son to a Corsican family of minor nobility. Um, his older brother, Joseph, was meant to be this smiling, happy baby who charmed everyone, whereas Napoleon was apparently a bit scrawny, a bit spindly, had to work a lot harder to get attention. So um, you could say perhaps psychologically there's something there from very early years about having to scrap a little. Certainly then when he's about nine, he goes off to a military school in France to learn how to be a soldier. And there also he's sort of mocked and taunted by his peers who are the sons of French nobility for his Corsican accent. So his experience in a lot of senses throughout early life and then later when he is climbing into the highest echelons of power is about entering a room and knowing that he is going to have to manoeuvre his way into power and respect rather than it necessarily being given to him from the first. How much do you think he was driven by those early experiences? Um, I think he was a sort of ultimate adapter and improviser. He would change plans, look at all the options, consider the most practical. That was something that um, influenced his military strategy as well as his political and self-fashioning strategy as well. To what extent do you think that from a very early age, this was a person who had something to prove? I think that could be true. Perhaps we could say rather than something to prove, big dreams to achieve. You can definitely call him ambitious and then interpret that in a positive or negative light as you wish. And his contemporaries certainly did. He was seen as everything from a sort of hero and savior of the revolution um, to a monstrous ogre bent on nothing but expansion and bringing suffering to the world. Gareth, um, did Napoleon think different, do you think, as outsider? Um, yes, certainly in his early days. I would agree with everything that's just been said. Uh, in his early days, he was a real reformer, not so much inventing ideas himself or bringing up new ideas himself, but almost developing the ideas of others and bringing them to fruition. And he certainly radicalised many areas of uh, France at that time and sort of brought it into a, a modern state, as we would almost call it. But that's the, the young Napoleon 
that is the later Napoleon, which is Mike has been mentioned about the fact that he becomes a, a, a real dictator uh, with a police state, lack of any compassion for the numbers of men he is actually destroying throughout Europe. There are almost two sides completely to the Napoleon we see. And those big defeats, um, as time went on, do you think Napoleon lost his touch or was it more of a case that enemies understood him better? But of both. Um, certainly enemies learned how to fight him. Certainly the Austrians and the Russians and the Prussians got better at it. Wellington seemed to have come up with a, a novel system that seemed to beat him from the start, so that was interesting. But there was also the fact that I think that he became less and less in touch with the realities of the situation. He almost refused to see that defeat was staring him in the eyes type thing. And there were many occasions he had uh, opportunities to actually stop the war and end up with a, a France bigger than it had started with, but refused to, always thinking he could turn the situation around and win another few victories that would defeat the Allies again, against him again. Uh, and that, unfortunately, that side of him ruined him and France. Um and uh, Mike, what do you think it was about Wellington that made him almost a nemesis for Napoleon? Oh, well, um, I mean, Wellington was a, a great tactician. Napoleon was a great strategist. And uh, when it came to their confrontation in 1815 at Waterloo, I mean, Wellington was on top of the battle. He knew exactly what was going on. Napoleon by then was not on top of the battle. And, you know, Napoleon's whole hundred days um, episode uh, coming back from Elba and then trying to t you know, take Paris again and recreate the, the old empire. It was it was always a, an illusion. It couldn't be done because while Napoleon was moving towards Waterloo with his Army of the North, 100,000 troops, 700,000 Allied troops were preparing to invade France. You know, the yeah. world had had enough of Napoleon. No, nobody was frightened of him anymore. They were going to remove him regardless. And that's why Waterloo, although it's the most studied battle in British military history, was strategically unimportant. I mean, it had to be fought. You know, somebody had to defeat Napoleon once more, fair and square, on the battlefield to put an end to all this nonsense. But if it hadn't been Waterloo, it would have been the next battle or the next battle. The fact is, Napoleon had no no chance of succeeding because as Gareth said I mean by the time he gets to 1815 he'd lost touch with reality and he'd stopped trying to link what, what he was so good at earlier in his career was linking the military instrument to his political intentions he was superb at doing that he defended the revolution he, he recreated France he then created a French empire all of that made perfect military political sense but as that empire began to come under pressure he lost that sense of relating the military to the political so by the time he gets to the hundred days and to waterloo he's living in a world of illusion all of his own which is why although a lot of british military historians don't like to hear it the battle of waterloo you know astonishingly dramatic as it was and terribly expensive as it was you know 45 to 53,000 men and over 10,000 horses lying dead inside a mile and a half at the end of the battle mm. i mean that's what it looked like but it was strategically unimportant and how many, Mike, of the secrets of Napoleon's success and lessons from his failures can we still see being employed by militaries today? Oh, uh, conventionally, very uh, quite a lot of them. Clarity of purpose, that understanding of the importance of strategy. The under, uh, I mean, the really good generals, really good ones, are able to see the strategy, see the operation level, and are good at the tactics as well. I mean, a lot of generals are good at two of those three, but not all three. Some of them are good at the operational and tactical. Some are good at the strategic and operational. You know, some are good at the top level or, or better at the bottom level. The really good generals are really good at all three, and that's what he was. He was good at all three during that time of his um, predominance. But, you know, his career is a great tra trajectory of, of early success, of mature success, of overextension, and then a failure. That's why it's so dramatic to, to follow his career. But when he was good, my goodness, he was good. And Gareth, if he were around today, how do you think we'd see Napoleon dealing with the likes of Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un? That's a good question, um, and it's one I've I often annoy many people about uh, uh, who love Napoleon. Certainly, the late Napoleon can be classed quite closely with many of them. You know, as I said, because he was literally 
he was watching the, the, the blood, lifeblood drain out of France and really didn't care as long as he kept his crown. Although he obviously tried to keep his army in love with him, uh, it is clear towards the end that the majority of his people did not love him anymore. And are you going to be going to see this new biopic of uh, Napoleon? If I do watch it, it'll be alone because I will drive oh. everybody mad. <laughs> uh, you talk at the screen, do you? <laughs> well, not, yeah, well, because I know I've already seen enough of the trailers to know that there are huge historical inaccuracies. Which, oh, no! <laughs> which, unfortunately, is very un- un- uh, uncomfortable for me and uncomfortable for anybody that sits oh. with me watching it. And I, I get it, I, I get it as entertainment, but, you know, he, his story is amazing enough that you don't hmm. need to invent stuff and perpetuate myths. And, unfortunately, it appears it okay. does. So, Gareth, you know, someone coming new to Napoleon, watching this film, they can, they can give you a call afterwards to clear things up, can they, Gareth? To know the truth, yeah? <laughs> or they can go and find a copy of my book, Napoleon and 100 Objects. Gareth Glover, good to speak to you. Thank you so much. And Ridley Scott's Napoleon is released across the UK on the 22nd of November. It will also be in BFBS Cinemas. You can check your local listings at bfbscinemas.com. Right, back to the present day and a country with ambitions to become the world's third biggest defence spender from its current position at number eight. Japan is on a military spending spree. It's abandoned the post-war promise that limited defence spending to 1% of GDP, Tokyo now has a target of 2% within five years. Of course, it also means that money to build its military might. Britain is part of the plan, which is why the Defence Secretary has just been in Tokyo talking about new fighter jets, joint exercises and a global strategic partnership. This is all largely driven by China and North Korea as potential threats, but building capacity takes time. So how capable is Japan right now with armed forces of a quarter of a million people? Dr. Chris Hughes is Professor of Japanese Studies and International Politics at the University of Warwick and author of Japan as a Global Military Power. There's a ground self-defence force, which is the largest part, which is about 150, 160,000 personnel. And then there's an air self-defence force, about 50,000. And then there's a, a maritime self-defence force, which is getting about 50, 60,000 or so. So it gives you about a quarter of a million standing army. They're pretty capable. So the ground self-defence forces are, you know, I say large and substantial, lots of lots of tanks and so on and artillery, because originally they were designed to stop a Soviet invasion of the north of Japan, but increasingly they've shifted southwards and they've become lighter and more mobile. Japan is starting to establish its own sort of Marine Corps and it's really looking to defend its southwestern islands against Chinese incursions. Uh, the Air Self-Defence Force is again very become very capable. Uh, used to be, I think, the most powerful um, Asian Air Force. China has become much more capable, but Japan has responded, particularly things like the F-35. And Japan mm. actually has the second largest inventory, or will do soon, of F-35s in the world after the United States. So, you know, pretty substantial. And then the Maritime Self-Defense Force, um, Japan's always maintained a very capable navy as, a, as an island nation. Around 50 destroyers or so, and around 20 submarines. And also what are called helicopter destroyers, but in fact are really light helicopter carriers. And they've been converted recently to carry F-35. So Japan is now back into maritime aviation and its own carriers. So it's a pretty substantial force, very well trained, very capable, um, very professional. Uh, And Japan is doing more since 2022. It's investing in all kinds of other capabilities. Certainly Japan is starting to move into things like what it calls counter-strike Uh, to be able to strike um, an opponent's territory if Japan is threatened by ballistic missile defences and so on. So it's engaged in a big build-up. Yeah, I'll I'll ask you a little bit more about counter-strike in a moment. Uh, Could you just tell us how many F-35s Japan has now and will have? Uh, And also tell me a little bit more about the tanks. Uh, so I think um, I'll have to. I would have to check my numbers, but I think it will have about 120 or so eventually. Alongside that, obviously, it has a lot of F-15s as well, um, which are still capable aircraft, and it's looking to, it's looking to replace its F-15s with this new fighter program that it's developing with the UK. So the Global Combat Air Program. So um, you know, it's, it's starting to go not just fifth generation, but sixth generation. Uh, in terms of tanks, yes, I mean um, Japan has a, a pretty c- capable tank force. I think it's about 300 tanks or so. But it has scaled that down since the Cold War. 
and it started to invest in lighter tanks and more mobile vehicles so that it can deploy to the southwestern islands to Okinawa to some of the islands that are close to Taiwan and it's investing in things like uh, amphibious vehicles as well so it's creating a kind of a little bit more like the sort of US marine type force. You mentioned earlier that Japan is developing its counter-strike capability can you tell me a bit more about that? What Japan calls counter-strike is really uh, retaliatory missile strikes. It's a kind of, again, it's coded Japanese language. It's a whole range of cruise missiles, which can be ground-launched by the self-defense forces or sea-launched. So it's, it's buying Tomahawk missiles from the United States. It'll have about 400 of those by 2026 to be launched from its destroyers. But also it's got a lot of uh, long-range anti-ship missiles, anti-ground missiles that the air self-defense forces will use as well. Uh, And also, in addition, Japan wants to develop hypersonic missiles as well. The idea is essentially that if, um, because Japan feels threatened by North Korean missiles, but also Chinese missiles in the event of a Taiwan contingency, uh, that Japan is not just going to sit there and sort of absorb those strikes. I mean, it, it, wanted, it has got very effective ballistic missile defence systems, but it feels that those are still no longer really adequate given the, the range of missiles and the number of missiles that it faces. So therefore, it now needs to have its own deterrent function to hit back. So for the first time in the post-war period, Japan can now actually has the capability to strike onto the East Asian continent. So how much bigger will the Japanese forces be in five years' time when they expect to have double defence spending? So they're not actually going to d- double defence spending. Uh, what they're going to, is about 1.6, but they will increase the amount of GDP spent on defence up to 2% because they'll, they'll recalculate using the NATO standard. So um, okay. there will be a 60% increase in defence. So, it's, so it's, a big, it's a big hike. How much bigger they'll be? I don't think they will be bigger. Their plan isn't to increase the number of personnel. It's actually sort of more of keep it the same. But I think what they will do is they'll probably shift around some numbers between the services. As I said, they're trying to move away from this sort of big force to counter land, big land invasion, and have much more mobile and light forces. So I think what you'll see is a kind of redistribution of forces away from the ground self-defence forces uh, and into the maritime and air self-defence forces and try and push numbers that way. And just finally, Chris, um, where do defence agreements between Japan and the UK fit into all of this? Uh, Pretty important, actually. So one of the really interesting features of Japanese defence and security policy the last 15 years, but also I think really accelerating in the last five or six or so, has been Japan's looking for more partners, out, not just the United States. Obviously, it's been a huge amount of effort into strengthening the US-Japan alliance, but it wants more partners, what it calls more kind of like-minded partners, that it can engage in the Indo-Pacific region to show that you know Japan is not alone, that China can't have it all its own way, that you know um, others think the same way as Japan and the United States. That's really important. So you know, the UK has started to show more presence in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also to, you know, to, to engage in some substantive military projects as well. Um, so, you know, through joint military exercises, you know, as you know, the UK has a reciprocal access agreement now with Japan to be able to, you know, move militaries back and forwards, share logistics and things like that. Uh, and then, as I, as I mentioned before, the Global Combat Air Program, you know, that's a really important program for Japan to develop a sixth generation fighter and to learn to um, do more defence industrial cooperation with, with other countries. So, you know, Japan sees the UK as a very safe, reliable partner, a good US ally, um, but they have lots of complementary interests, lots of complementary capabilities. Um, so I think actually there's there's a lot of mileage in that, in that relationship if it's um, carefully managed. Dr. Chris Hughes, good to speak to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, we mentioned Taiwan several times there. It's 1,400 miles from Japan. In the event of a military conflict between Taiwan and China, how likely is Japan to choose to get involved? Well, I think it would depend on the type of crisis. I mean, if Japan just uh, just watched while China launched an attack on Taiwan, I think it would be very difficult for it to get involved. But I don't think it's going to be like that. Um, China is more likely to actually sort of put a noose around Taiwan and just try to tighten it. It would be a blockade that would start as a, a sort of an economic blockade and become more militarized and get tighter and tighter. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of, of, of that already, to be honest. And I think that's what we're going to see in the next few years. And I think in 
in that case, I think Japan, along with the United States and Britain and some other powers, would actually try to stop that noose tightening. So I, there, I think Japan would get involved in a sort of a more gradual process of trying to prevent China from uh, literally throttling Taiwan and provoking a military crisis um, that the West would then have to have, have to initiate. That's what that's what China's strategy would almost certainly be. And I think the Japanese are thinking about that very hard at the moment. And I think they would be involved given the way they're developing their military. This is all a huge shift for Japan, which effectively committed to pacifism after its part in World War II. How much could this shift the balance of military power around the world, do you think? Oh, well, quite a lot. I mean, interestingly, as Chris was saying there, I mean, Japan is exactly twi- almost exactly twice the population of Britain. And its forces are almost twice the size of Britain. It's ground forces twice the size, it's air force twice the size, it's navy twice the size. And that's on the basis of spending 1% of its GDP on defense. Mm. Now, it's, it's beginning to go up from that now. And what you can see is that, you know, because Japan is a, is a very populous country and a rich country, you know, a small amount of, of defense expenditure buys quite a lot. And it's beginning to spend a bit more. And the other thing that's happening is that Japan and South Korea are coming together. You know, just a few years ago, you, you, the Japanese and the South Koreans would not countenance the idea of cooperating on defense. Mm. Uh, because of the background, because of the Second World War, they wouldn't take it seriously. And I remember, you know, raising it in meetings in Tokyo, and it's the only time you see Japanese officials get angry. And they say, no, 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 we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. And it was very interesting. It was off the table. You could not talk about collaboration with South Korea. But now it is happening. And this is, you know, we talked about Napoleon earlier on and the, uh, you know, European balance of power in the 19, early 19th century. What you see in East Asia, since 2012, only since 2012, with Xi Jinping's uh, accession to power, China is asserting itself very aggressively across the whole of Pacific Asia. And so there is a new balance of power forming. Japan and South Korea are beginning to move together. Vietnam and the United States are beginning to do a lot more together. The Philippines is beginning to uh, open itself now to U.S. bases. A new balance of power is arising Mm. because of China in East Asia. And Japan understands, I think, that it is intrinsically important to that new power balance that's taking shape. And I think that's that's where we are, which is why Britain's relationships with Japan now are potentially really important. I mean, they could be quite quite committing as well, but this is a good moment. If global Britain is going to mean anything, this is mm. a very good moment for Britain to get much closer to Japan reciprocally in terms of defence and defence production. Well, there was much more to my conversation with Chris Hughes, including whether a lack of combat experience could impact Japan's capability. The whole conversation is online now in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast. News, discussions and analysis. This is SITREP. The fight in Ukraine is moving to a new stage, from manoeuvre to positional warfare, or to put it another way, stalemate. That is the blunt assessment from the commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces. General Valery Zaluzhny set out his thinking in an essay and accompanying interview for The Economist magazine. He's also set out how he thinks he can break that deadlock and achieve victory. No surprises for guessing. It involves a lot more kit. Uh, Mike, just before we dig into the possible solutions, can you briefly explain for the layman what General Zaluzhny means by positional versus manoeuvre warfare? Yes. I mean, both sides then hold certain positions. They'll try to dislodge each other from those positions. But instead of one side you know, moving quickly to try and outflank the other side, they'll try, they'll compete for key positions. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not sure that that's quite the same as stalemate, but nevertheless, it's a different conception than maneuver warfare. And whereas in the West, we've always talked since the Second World War, maneuver warfare. In fact, the early part of the Second World War was all positional. You held a position and you tried not to lose it and you tried to grab another position and hold on to that. That's where they are in Ukraine at the moment. Well, let's bring in once again our Ukraine reporter, Simon Newton. Simon, hi. Uh, General Zaluzhny's solution to this deadlock then, it, it includes the basics like missiles and shells. We've talked many times before about air superiority, so it's no surprise that's on his list. Just talk us through what else is. 
I mean, he talks about air superiority in the essay that he wrote, but, you know, interestingly, it doesn't include F-16s. He focuses really on drone warfare, drone technology as being the solution to it. He talks about Ukraine needing to field swarms of drones against the Russian lines, that that's the solution to try and overcome this problem of not having any sort of air superiority over their own lines. He, he, he talks about electronic warfare as another area where the Russians have a kind of superiority. They've invested very heavily in it. He talks about the Excalibur shell, for instance, which the Americans have supplied to the Ukrainians, uh, which is a, a GPS-guided precision 155 millimeter shell. The Russians have found a way of kind of confusing that shell and making it much less effective. So that's an area he says they need a counter battery, which is effectively being able to f- see where uh, a gun is firing from and then quickly target that gun before it can move away. They want more of those sort of uh, bits of kit as well. Mine clearance, another massive area. They're, they're up against you know 20 kilometer deep. Uh, Russian minefields. So he's talking about them needing robotic machines possibly to go underneath those minefields. Um, Also a lot more drones and explosive equipment to get their way through that. The biggest, also the other one is reserves. He talks about Ukraine having, well Russia, sorry, having three times as many men to field as the uh, Ukrainians have. So effectively the Ukrainians will run out of of men at, at some point in the future. And how realistic is that list, both to acquire what he wants mm. and deliver victory? I, I, don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. I think it, it seems realistic in many senses because he's asking for kit that they have, have already had before. Um, he, you know, he doesn't mention tanks, for instance, in this, in this essay. He doesn't mention F-16. So he's asking for lower level stuff in larger quantities. But he does focus very much on technology. That seems to be what he thinks is the answer. And in an interview he gives to The Economist, he, he's, you know, he draws this analogy to the Chinese inventing gunpowder. He says we've got to come up with some sort of absolutely radical, new, innovative technological solution to this problem that will give far more than just parity with the Russians, will will sort of propel the Ukrainian forces forward and make this beautiful breakthrough that he says isn't happening at the moment. Moscow, he says, you know, has this massive economic force behind it. They're investing, I think, $105 billion next year in their military. It's going to be a third of their whole national budget is going into the military. So effectively, that's where he says the Ukrainians have got to find money, they've got to find technology. And this, this very sobering thought right at the end effectively that that, the Ukrainians will run out of manpower unless they move on and get this war finished as quickly as possible. Mike, why would he do this? It's an odd thing to do in a way because um, this is not the message the Ukrainians want to send to the West and it's brought him into conflict with uh, President Zelensky who has the opposite message that they're doing well and they'll continue to do well if if they're supported. So I, I think that He's probably doing this because he wants to shock the West into saying, look, you know, we're not going to lose, but we are falling into stalemate, which is what you all fear, unless we get more equipment. And I think in a way, it's not so much a realistic estimate of what's happening, so much as a wake up call to the West that we don't want this war to drag on. You don't want it to drag on. The only way to stop it dragging on is to give us a lot more equipment. I think that's probably the reason he's done it, but it's a high risk strategy because this is exactly the message that Kiev doesn't want to project at a time when the West is now distracted by the Gaza crisis and worrying increasingly about, you know, Trump and the White House after 2024. And Simon, do you think this reveals a deeper level of disagreement between President Zelensky and his military commanders? Well, I think we've seen there's been rumours for the past year or so that there's been disagreements going on behind the scenes. And obviously this week, we've, we've not only had this article, we've also had uh, Zelensky firing his head of special forces, General Viktor Korenko, for another interview that he gave talking about special operations. He himself has you know, dismissed these remarks and saying there's no stalemate underway. We've also had uh, a Time magazine article this week, which has been quite scathing about uh, the way Zelensky has been operating uh, with his military commanders. So I think I think there, it, it does it does uncover, does dig down into things that are going on behind the scenes. Why are these commanders feeling empowered to speak now? Zelensky is obviously potentially facing election next year. Maybe that's one of the reasons. I mean, we've all we've all dealt with the with the military media machine in our in our careers, and we know exactly how much thought goes into them releasing any sort of information like this. So you can imagine sort of Zelensky's head hitting the desk when when he read this document. But um, it does uncover that there are tensions going on definitely behind the scenes. And how's it gone down in Moscow? 
Well, they they have dismissed it, saying there's no stalemate. Their special oper- special military operation, they're saying, will fulfil all of its objectives. Um, you know, if interesting, if you read some of the Russian media, which I've which I've done, they they talk about stalemate. They interpret the word stalemate as being losing, effectively, um, and they mm-hmm. they're talking about the general having sort of had a a bit a bit of a turn in terms of speaking out, and that he's actually telling the truth that the Russians will not be defeated. They will push forward, and they also make great play about what effect this would have on. The, on your average Ukrainian soldier who reads this uh, with his senior commander talking about the fact that uh, you know they could be moving towards a stalemate position. Uh, Mike, it also seems like an odd idea to tell Moscow what your plan relies on, even if it's not very surprising. Yes, um, although I, I think the, the, the Zeluzny, I think, f- may feel that he's he's got to do this. And, I, and I'm fairly sure that the Ukrainians will keep on fighting over the winter. And I think whatever he's saying, I think they still hold on to the hope that the Russians are so stretched that they will crack in some significant ways. Either in Moscow, they'll crack or on the front lines, they'll crack in some way that will make a difference. Um, but I think Zeluzny is also going back on that soldier's understanding that you've got to fight a war of attrition very often before you can enjoy the benefits of the breakthrough. Um, it won't be any surprise to Moscow uh, that that's maybe what he's thinking because that's in the nature of of this war. I mean, this is the first big 20th century style war in the 21st century, which is a, a war of, of um, industrial proportions. And in that respect, it, it's got a lot of the old maxims of war about it. You can't get away from that. One side will know what the other side intends because it's such a big war. Mike, Simon, thank you so much. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. Don't forget, if you want to hear more about Japan's drive to become a much bigger military player in the world, there's an extra edition of the sit rep podcast online now. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. (laughs) 